while I've got this little Admiral opened up on my workbench, I figured I might as well uh, do a bit more on it. So what I did is I pulled out all the tubes, tested them, only found one tube that was a bit weak and had some uh, some leakage in it. Uh, it was a 3CB6 uh, and uh, I located a replacement. I also cleaned up all the tubes, so nice and shiny. And uh, now I'm just doing a, a quick recap. Um, circuit board tilts down. It is actually hardwired in, but it's pretty easy to get at. All right, many capacitors though. Uh, I already cut one out here, and I'm about to replace it. And there's one here. Ceramic discs ra rarely go bad. I've been checking the resistors too, but so far they've all been with intolerance. Um, that's it. It's just those two film caps on this whole board. And the others are a bit less accessible. There's one way back in there on the uh, tuner. A blue guy back in there. I think that will be quite challenging to get out. So you have to actually remove, unmount the tuner to get at it. So I think I'll just leave that one in for the time being. Uh, da, da, da. I don't see any back here. So they used a lot of ceramic disc capacitors in this set. Probably accounts for why it uh, is working pretty well without having me, without me having uh, done a recap on it yet. Let's see, it's got to be some capacitors. Got high voltage suction. Yeah. Okay, there, there's where all the capacitors are hiding. They're all down in here. Although these uh, look like they're plastic, uh, that actually is a paper cap. They're just encapsulated in tubes. Uh, so they're just as prone to failure. Uh, there's a bunch of lytic, so a couple more caps in there. Let's see, how do you get at those? Oh, they're a little bored. Hmm. Uh, that's what they call black beauty. That's definitely got to go. Those are really uh, prone to failure. Hmm. <laughs> that was bored is screwed in. Uh, one there. Looks like there's one there. I don't think I can get at that screw though, unless I take the picture tube out. <laughs> so. Uh, you know, these, these little portable sets are a bit of a challenge to work on because everything is really crammed in there. Well, I'll do what I can. Let's see about uh, trying to get this board out. So looks like that's what most of the capacitors are. And it'd be great if I could unmount this board and uh, be able to really work on it. Otherwise, these capacitors do come up quite easily. Uh, just carefully uh, use some solder wick and. Uh, you know, look the solder off and then uh, carefully remove the leads. You don't want to overheat these though, these traces can lift off the board. I found it's also easy to uh, clip the component out first, so you just have the two bits of wire left and then a little bit of heat and they just uh, pull right out. Uh, let's see, as far as the controls go, I sprayed some deoxin on the volume, looks it seems a bit scratchy. And I found out why that brightness control is so flaky. One of the uh, twist tabs on it broke off. So here's those controls, and there's little tabs that come off the potentiometers and they go through these holes, and then they're twisted over. Well, this one it had broken off, and it looks like somebody tried to solder it back on, but that uh, that joint has failed, so the control is really loose and flopping. I think it's also probably quite dirty or maybe even shot. But it's just a 100k pot so it's a very common value. I'm sure I've got some lying around so I'm going to try to dig one up. Uh, I'm popping in. Now as far as putting the new part on, simply threaded new capacitor to the circuit board. I bent over the leads a bit. And then I'll take my soldering iron and a bit of solder and heat up one side and apply the solder to the other. 
Uh, there we go. And then this guy. here sharp uh, cutters bent at an angle so you can get right down the circuit board like so and like so and it's one down as far as the types of capacitors I'm using for the replacements uh, I uh, use polyester and polypropylene film capacitors these are both made by Mallory I believe because they have a little M on them not quite sure why one's white and one's yellow. It could be that's the polypropylene, that's polyester. Either way, uh, film, modern film capacitors, uh, the specs on these vastly exceed the old uh, paper and wax capacitors. For the voltage rating, um, I, I like to exceed what was there. For example, this is a 0 .04700 volts uh, DC. This is a 630 volt cap. Most uh, film capacitors, or I should say a very common voltage for film capacitors these days is 630. If you go to some place like uh, JustRadios.com, they have a huge selection of 630 volt caps and you can get the, uh, an assortment kit too if you're just starting out and you want to stock up on all the commonly used values. 0.047 uh, I'd say is the most common capacitor you're going to find in TVs, followed by 0.1 and 0.01. I uh, also probably encounter a 0 0.022 and maybe a 0 0.001. Um, so I always keep a, a supply of those on hand. I just discovered there was one more capacitor hiding on this main board here. It's this guy, which is uh, a little bit uh, unusual for a vintage set. Normally they're this type which they call axial meaning the leads come out of the along the axis of the body whereas this is what they call radial style meaning they come out at uh, one end so to replace that I will use one of these little chiclet guys it seems to me the best way to get all these components back in here and down there is to pull the picture tube so what I have to do is remove the plug back here, that's easy enough. Slide off this ion trap magnet and the centering rings and loosen up the strap here and then it should pull out the front. I uh, have to be careful about the spring too. This set doesn't have any high voltage capacitor. Uh, to save money, they just use the inherent capacitance of the pitcher tube to filter the uh, AC. So the spring has to make good contact with the outer conductive coating on the pitcher tube. And it looks like somebody taped it down here, so I'm going to lift that off carefully. I'm also going to take a Sharpie and mark the location of this magnet and these other various bits. So I can put them back on because the position of these is critical to getting a good sharp picture. I'll also take a few reference photos. Once I do, uh, I think it's really going to open up all this stuff and I'll be able to finish recapping much, much easier. That wasn't too bad. The trickiest part is that the yoke had fused to the pitcher tube. There's a piece of old tape here and over time the adhesive from this seems to have kind of melted into the yoke. So what I had to do was put a thin screwdriver between the two and carefully pry it up. Here's the yoke itself. It's in pretty good shape. I'll have to be careful though because it just flops around without the CRT to support it. And I do not want to damage it. And I certainly don't want to damage the picture tube either so this is going well out of harm's way. Maybe on top of my refrigerator or something like that. And now I can certainly get it all these goodies in here. So all these caps gotta go. And this and this and this and this and this and that and that. And that.
With that pitcher tube out of the way, I've been making some pretty good progress, replacing all the old capacitors and even some out of tolerance resistors, like this 47K that was measuring way out of spec. Also found a 330 ohm cathode bias resistor on the audio output tube that's measuring about 500. Replacing that should have a definite impact on the sound output. A few things I want to talk about that I discovered while working on this uh, set is, uh, one, I found one of these capacitors. These are known as Black Beauties. And unlike these other capacitors, which are clearly marked with a capacitance and a voltage, like 0.1 microfarad, 600 volts, this just has stripes like a resistor. These may look more modern, more reliable, but they're just as prone to failure and should really replace them. Also, when these go bad, they tend to make a nice loud pop because of that plastic case around the, uh, the capacitor. So I went online and searched for Black Beauty color code, and I found this very handy chart. It's just like the resistor color code in that it's got uh, uh, 10 different colors to score correspond to digit 0 through 9. If you're going to be working on electronics to any extent, I suggest you try to measure, memorize this chart. I think I had it memorized by the time I was 10 or 11, and it's been very, very handy to know. <laughs> Alright, so to read this, the first stripe is the first digit, second stripe second digit, third stripe is a number of zeros. And you read this off in micro microfarads, also known as picofarads. So here we've got yellow, which is 4, violet, which is 7, and orange, which is 3, for 3 zeros. So 47,000 picofarads, also known as 0 0.047 microfarads. The next stripe is the tolerance, which is how much the actual measured capacitance can vary from the stated value for this to still be considered a good capacitor. Although it looks kind of dark grayish, really that's black. The manufacturers couldn't very well have a black stripe on a black background and expect you to see it, so they used a very dark gray. Over here, black, plus minus 20%. The replacements I've been using, like this guy, are plus minus 5%, or this one, which is, I think, plus minus 10%. Uh, both 5%. Uh, there's some 10% guys. Both uh, far uh, exceed the original spec, so no problem there. The final stripe, or two stripes, are the voltage rating at hundreds of volts. In this case, we have red, so it's two 200 volts. The second stripe would be used, say, with a 250 volt cap. It would be red and green. A few other interesting things I discovered. I knew that this was a series wired set, meaning the tubes were strung up in series for the filaments and that the DC voltage to power the set was derived by rectifying the AC line with a voltage doubler. What I didn't realize was that this whole chassis is hot. What I thought they had done was left this chassis floating and routed all of the ground just using some thick insulated wire because it's in a metal cabinet and you don't want people getting shocked when they pick up the TV. But what they actually did is this whole chassis is going right to one side of the AC cord. See in a schematic here, here's the AC input switch. I didn't realize that ground was, was actually all this coppery surface you see. I thought that that was isolated from it. What they did to protect the user was they put these little plastic isolation mounting points all over. Well, if any of these were to wear out or have a screw poke through them or something to connect the metal cabinet to the metal frame, you could easily have the entire set being uh, hot, which is not a good thing. Uh, for now, I'll just be, make sure that these are all in good condition and be careful when I put it back together, but something, definitely something to be very well aware of. Something to consider doing too is to replace the AC input on this with a polarized cord. Uh, let's see, where is it? Yeah, here it is. 
So both of these input lugs are the same in diameter, so it's, that's what they call a non-polarized plug. I could re unmount this and replace this with something a little safer, which would be polarized, which would ensure that this whole thing was the white neutral side of the AC cord.